This is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. Our guest this week is an actor, director, producer, and businessman who's appeared in shows like 77 Sunset Strip, Love American Style, Fantasy Island, and Murder, She Wrote. But he'll forever be known as Jed Clampett's slow-witted but ambitious nephew, Jethro Bodine, on the iconic TV series, The Beverly Hillbillies. He also produced two of the most successful independent films in history, Macon County Line and Ode to Billy Joe. For the past 25 years, he's been a man on a mission to create an elaborate Beverly Hills-themed hotel and casino, including attractions such as Granny's White Lightning Bar and Jethro's All You Can Eat. That's right, <laughs> Jethro's All You Can Eat Buffet. Please welcome the low-key and laid-back Max Bayer Jr., Geez, I didn't even know who that guy was the way you were introducing him, Jay. <laughs> now, can you... Shoot, can I'd you, like to meet that idiot. <laughs> <laughs> now, can you tell us, because we had to start the interview a couple of minutes late, what you were busy doing. Oh, you just now? Are we live? Yes, yes. yes. This, this is it, buddy. I didn't know well, we were live. I yeah, thought we were... Tape. I don't know. Tape. Well, live on tape. Yeah, I feel like you're yeah, yeah. live on tape, but yeah. I feel like I'm on tape because everybody the, the NSA is taping everybody's ass anyway. So what's oh. the difference? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I can't even I can't even have a gas break at 77 without having them check me out. <laughs> I think I think I think I think I think we I think the public should give the the, the White House a colonoscopy is what I think. <laughs> Anyway, what I was doing, Gil, when you called, I live in Lake Tahoe, and I have a hill that's on the little side of a hill, and underneath it grows some wild brush. And the fire department said it was like gas; it would burn like gasoline if it ever caught fire, and it was it would take my house right with it. So I was out there with a chainsaw and, a, and another guy, and then we were cutting the branches and then pulling them down the hill with a with a four by four, so that uh, the fire department could come, and then they put them in a chipper and they chipped the stuff back up on the hill. I said, what the hell does that do? I, it just makes it easier to burn, doesn't it? <laughs> I just fire west. If you have a big log, it takes a long time to light it. If you have little tiny chips, they go up like, well, you know, like paper. And he says, well, that's the law. I says, well, it's another good law right out of Washington. <laughs> this is straight out of the Beverly Hillbillies, your life. <laughs> hey, let me, my, my life, my life is, hey, look, at my life is worse than the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> I make Duck I make Duck Dynasty look like Shakespeare. <laughs> now, Are you kidding me? <laughs> Jesus, Lord of mercy. I didn't think if I knew I was going to live this long, I'd have taken a hell of a lot better care of myself, stopped the drugs earlier than later. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> Max, we got to ask you about the casino, uh, this, this uh, lifelong... Uh, Pursuit. Now, we're in a lawsuit over the land, and and that and that's more BS. You know, it's uh, you, you know, uh, anytime you deal with 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 cities and the laws of the cities and the zonings and all of that stuff, uh, you might as well just you know take a pill and go to sleep. You know, because <laughs> you ain't going to go anywhere. I mean, they got so many restrictions. You can go to the bathroom, but you can't use toilet paper. You can eat garlic, but you can't take uh, any kind of uh, uh, mouthwash. I mean, it's the weirdest thing in the world. You can chew, but you can't swallow. It's a, just it's nuts. Well, take, the take, world is crazy. Take us back, Max, just for our, for our listeners and for, for, for uh, Gilbert's edification in mind. Take us back a, a little bit about the history of this project. Of the, of the Beverly, well, what happens is I, re, I retired after, uh, uh, in 1978, 79, I didn't have to work anymore because what happened is that, uh, we bought, I, my partner and I, we made enough money off of, 
uh, uh, Macon County line and owed to Billy Joe that we could, we could both not do anything. And we bought a lot of real estate and took a, uh, on the Wilshire Corridor, which is from Westwood Boulevard to Beverly uh, Hills Country Club. And, now, uh, now, I think you are saying uh, you're, you're not uh, a has-been with no money. No, the, what I've said was is that, is that uh, I'm a has-been, I used to be and a was, but at one time I was a goddamn is. <laughs> <laughs> but you said now you're a has-been with money. Yeah, that's right. In other words, if you're a has-been with money, you can open your mouth, and and you're sophisticated, like Donald Trump. But if he was a bust-out, nobody would listen to him. That's true. So, he, he was born on third base and thought he hit a triple. You know, he, he didn't come out like nobody, like 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 Ross Perot started with nothing. He didn't. He didn't. I'm not that I'm a big fan of his, but you know, he he actually had his father was very wealthy, and then he turned his father's wealth into something else. But nobody ever mentions the three or four bankruptcies in the right. in the gaming uh, uh, area that he's had. Fred Trump. If he's going to run, if he's going to run the country, if he's going to be my president, and if he were my president. I'd ask, or running for it, I'd ask him a couple of questions. I'd say, hey, look, at if you're the head guy, if you're the guy that Harry Truman says the buck stops at my desk, then you are directly responsible for the three or four bankruptcies that you've had. However, if you just hired the people to run the place and they bankrupted the company, well, then how in the hell am I going to have you get the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Interior, and they're going to all be stupid stew. And, and you're Max Bayer, and yeah. you approve this message. Now, I approve this message. I approve. Yeah. Hey, look it. I've had my foot in my mouth so many times. I go to a cobbler for my dental work. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, Max, we got off track a second. Tell us about the casino and the plan. And the plan. It's a pretty grand well, plan. The plan is online. It's under Jethro's Beverly Hillbilly Mansion and Casino. Mm -hmm. But I've tried to do it in. I've tried to do it at the Aladdin Hotel when it was the Aladdin in Vegas. Couldn't do it there. Tried to do it in Verde, Nevada, out on the Interstate 80. Tried to do it in Sparks, Nevada. Tried to do it in downtown Reno. I tried to do it in Carson City. As a matter of fact, I was so tired of trying to do it at places, I bought an, a Walmart that was just going to be empty, and they're moving to a new location. I bought that thinking I could build it there. And then the city has restrictions. You can't build it there. So then I went over to Douglas, sold that, what, took the money, went over to Douglas County, put about another $7.5 million in that property, and, and they were going to do a, a big shopping center there. And then the market changed. The banks collapsed. Nobody would loan them money so that they could do the infrastructure, you know, put in the oil, put in the water, the gas, the, the, I mean, the water, the um, gas lines, the water lines, the sewer lines. So they didn't do anything. So I'm stuck with this piece of property that I can't build anything. I could probably put an outhouse on it, put, put uh, the Beverly Hills the outhouse on it and they use it. Just, every time I leave my house, I just say, hey, I'm going to the bathroom and I get my car and drive 23 miles and then take a dump. Well, I'm glad you straightened that out. Hey, let me, let me tell you something. I was a little confused. It is confused. wonderful to be able to say what's on your mind. <laughs> wonderful. As a matter of fact, when I was doing the show, I was Peck's bad boy because it was one, two, three, kick, one, two, three, kick, one, two, three, kick. And I didn't like that. I said, what the hell? You want a bunch of, you want a bunch of parrots? You know, and then I'd get in trouble with Paul Henning because he was the writer creator, the genius behind the show, and he really was. Right, sure. He gave him all the respect in the world, but I, I had he would write words in a scene where you're walking upstairs and you've got one line. Well, how do you walk up the stairs saying one line? You got a lot of pauses. Oh, oh. How now, are now, you? And I, I, it take me, it take me about twenty six, thirty seconds to get up the 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 the, 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 hit of the stairs, and I only had one line. I do that. I can't stretch it that far. I could be, I could become like that guy that used to be in the movies. I can't remember his name. He stuttered all the time. Joe, uh, his name was Joe Joe something. He used to have a cigar. He used to go. Bah, 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 bah. He couldn't. He couldn't speak. Who is that, Gilbert? Do you know who he's talking about? I remember. Well, he was out of the. He was out of the forties or something like that, and he would always, you know, like that. You know, he could never get the words out. You know, now you couldn't do that on TV because they say you were making fun of of, of of children that are that are handicapped. You cannot say the word retard. That's the person is a football player.
If he's a football player, then you can say he's retarded. You can't use that word. You can't use so many words today. You can't say, you can't, I was watching TV last night. They had an interview with somebody, and you can't say, how tall are you? Because you might have the short people. I don't know what the hell it is. So you were a troublemaker on the Beverly Hillbillies set, Max. I'm lying to you, but I'm telling you the truth. What, what are some they, other things you can't say? You can't say, you can't say, how old are you? You can't say what sex are you? You can't ask any questions at all. You got to hire them and find out that they're friggin' idiots. I will, You know what? what? If if these wall, if these laws were made for airline pilots, nobody would friggin' fly. Now look, can can I go back a couple of years? You can go and- wherever you want to go. You're free. <laughs> 1865, they freed all of you, even all the white people. <laughs> now, now, your father was the legendary fighter Max Bear. Right. And tell us about the famous historical fight he had when Hitler was coming into power. Oh, when he fought Max Schmeling. Yeah. Oh, that was 1933. He, he, he was, he was uh, set up... Uh, um, Max Schmeling is the only fighter that won the title on the floor and lost it standing up. And here's how it happened. He fought Jack Sharkey. Jack Sharkey fouled him, and he won the title on the floor. Then he fought Sharkey and lost the decision to him, and he was standing up. Then he fought, uh, then my dad ended up fighting, then uh, I should say Carnera fought Sharkey, beat Sharkey, my dad fought Schmeling in 33, and that got him the fight in 34 for the championship with Carnera. But, it, but when he fought in 1933, my dad's manager, Ansel Hoffman, knew that my dad had some Jewish blood in him. But to be really Jewish, you have to be on, you have to be on your mother's side. Well, mine was on, my dad's was on his father's side, but Ansel didn't care at the time. He was Jewish, and he just said, stick the Star of David on there. So he put the Star of David on there. And my dad was a young kid. He didn't have a formal education. And he said, well, these are the Nazis, and this is what they're doing. And he showed him some footage and some stuff. And my dad hated it. Uh, uh, Max Schmeling. He didn't know him, but he hated what they told him about him. So he trained very hard for that fight, and he beat Schmeling very badly, and he knocked him out in the 10th round. And uh, he actually fought dirty in that fight. I mean, he did. He did everything but kick Schmeling. Wow. I mean, he really did. He backhanded him and did everything. And But, he, but uh, uh, then, after after the Schmeling fight, when he, he went down to, he, he'd heard other things about Schmeling. Schmeling was a gentleman. And my dad went down to the boat to see him off back to uh, back to Germany, and uh, he was totally misguided. The only two people that he disliked in boxing were Tony Galeno and Max Schmeling. Two Max Tony. Schmeling because of his Nazi, of his German heritage, that they told my dad the untruth that that Schmeling was a Nazi, which he was not, and Tony Galeno because he insulted my my dad's mother and father. By making wisecracks and and bad, I think my dad felt uh, terrible remarks. So my dad wanted to just uh, beat him to death, basically. But at, but he that was before the fight. After the fight, my dad only had some animosity towards Galeno, but none towards Schmeling. And then years later, when they were all in the war, my uncle Bud, Joe Lewis, uh, my dad, uh, you know, a lot of people were in the war that were like boxers. And uh, then he and he and Tony started doing charity things together, you know, for the Elks and the Mooks, Moose and the USO and all that stuff. And then my dad and Tony became friendly. And this and my dad was hardly one to keep a grudge. He just uh, he uh, he was friends with everybody. As a matter of fact, Joe Lewis beat my dad. I was the first guy to really beat my dad, and he was a Paul Bear at my dad's funeral. Wow! He, he and my dad were very very close friends. As a matter of fact, when I was in I was in Vegas one time on the, when I was on the series and Milton was Milton Burrow was playing at the Sands I think, and I was up there for a golf tournament and I was half buzzed on something I have no idea what <laughs> probably Pepsi Cola anyway uh, or maybe it was Coca Cola but it was I had an old bottle from the 1900s when it had the good stuff in it before they changed the it to caffeine yeah. you know that's what I called it Coca Cola right. anyway so I said something to Milton where I was heckling him or something. And he introduced me, and uh, they, I got nice applause and all that stuff, being on the number one show on TV and all that crap, and all that blowing smoke up my rear end, you know, Christ. 
but yeah, it'll screw up the autopsy if they ever find it, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, so so what happened is that Milton said, he said, Joe Lewis hit your old man so hard, you came out punchy. <laughs> and I would, which was very funny. And then on the golf course the next day, I was playing with Joe in a women's golf tournament and at the Desert Inn, and I told him the joke, and I've got the picture here on my dresser uh, where Joe is absolutely looks like he's going to die from laughing. He's, you know, Joe was so serious, and he had, he had his grin from ear to ear. And I played a lot of golf with Joe Lewis. And man, a bunch, a bunch of ex-boxers. I used to, we used to kibitz and play and all that crap. Yeah, because, I mean, that was a historical fight. Cause he... Well, it was because the, cause Hitler had taken over as chancellor. He wasn't uh, the Fuhrer yet. He was just chancellor. Hindenburg was still alive. So Hindenburg hadn't died yet, so he was chancellor. When Hindenburg died, then he became... Uh, the Fuhrer, and which was she was everybody. He was God, and he was a German. guy in a wearing a star of David, kicking this German guy's ass. Yeah, this was it was pretty ridiculous. It was sixty thousand people there, I think. Yeah, in Yankee Stadium, very historic. Greta Garbo called it a victory over fascism. Yeah, well, you know, my dad was under contract when he after he beat Schmeling, he went he went and he he did a movie called The Price Fighter and the Lady. Oh, sure, with, with Myrna Loy. With Myrna Loy and then Primo Carnera, who he was going to fight for the championship, and Jack Dempsey and Walter Houston. And uh, Walter would stand behind the camera and off camera a little bit. And if my dad would do a scene and Walter would look at him and shake his head, then my dad would say, hey, let me do another one. And if he would gag, he'd wink at my dad, then my dad would say, oh, that's good. Let's go to the next thing. Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, now, now, one of your father's greatest accomplishments, or a few, uh, after he beat Schmeling, didn't he fuck uh, Greta Garbo? Didn't he fight Greta Garbo? No, no, no fuck no. Greta not, Garbo. Not Garbo, Dietrich. 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 Well, I have Dietrich. no idea, but he, 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 he I, I tell you, he had a, he, he was way before his times, because as best I know about my dad is he had an automatic zipper. <laughs> Now I heard Greta Garbo invited him. Oh, he, over. he was he had if if Gene Harlow used to chase him around and wait sit in her car and wait out in front of his house wow. up on King's Road. Wow, platinum blonde. Yeah, well he was with her and then, but he didn't want to be tied down. You know, he was out there trying to. He was like looking for a, a toilet seat in a shell station. You know, he was looking <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> It didn't. It didn't make any difference. You know. I mean, he was. You know, he was everywhere. So he, he was, was everywhere. With he was all, all these, over like mud. These famous. He, you know, act- and, and and Louis B. Mayer, because one day he was doing something and he took off. I don't know who it, whether it was Red or Marlena or whoever it was, but he took off and they went up to Santa Barbara and fooled around up there. And Louis B. Mayer says he'll never work for me again, because uh, he was he was so irresponsible. You know, he didn't give a damn that, you know, you had to shoot that day. And was, he was in all the shots. <laughs> so he just, he just hey, look it. He says, he says he had a, he used to say about himself, he had a, he had a million dollar body and a 10 cent brain. <laughs> now, now here, and, and this, this is a, a thing. Uh, you, you were very much against that film Cinderella, man. With, yeah. Yeah. With Russell Crowe. Right. Well, the reason why is that Ronnie Howard, who directed it, and he's a fine director, and he's a good human being. Generally speaking, Ronnie is a, he is a cause celeb. He's a good person. But why he did what he did to my father in there is unforgivable in my mind. He never apologized, never said anything, never called me. Uh, none of that. And neither did Penny Marshall. Now Penny, Penny was the director of it at first, and then they took either she lost it or did something or did that. Who knows? But she became a producer, an executive producer, producer on the on the movie. She had something to do with it. But it was the getting Ron Howard to cast Russell Crowe that got the movie made. That was what it was, and he had worked with Russell before, and where he won the uh, Academy oh, yeah. Award. Oh no, yeah, Beautiful no, Mind. He won the Academy Award in Gladiator, but where he got nominated in A Beautiful Mind. Yeah. But anyway, um, uh, what happened is that Ronnie, for whatever reason, and the writer, decided that they to make Jimmy Braddock more of a hero, 
they had to have an Apollo Creed. I mean, I'm mean, sorry. They had to have a Clubber Lang, which was the villain in the Rocky movies in Rocky th- two, three, and four. Okay, in Clubber Lang, that was Mr. T. He had no redeeming characteristics. He was rude as hell. He said, did the same thing to Rocky and his wife, Talia Shire, Shire, when they were having their press conference. Hey, I'm a man. Your wife can come over to my house. You know, he did right out of Rocky. But he could have done it. He could have done the character of Max Bear like Apollo Creed, which was exactly what my father was. He was like Muhammad Ali. He was trying to promote the gate. He was trying to make as much money as he could, and so he would basically say things and all that stuff just to just to get a rise out of people, just to promote the gate. That's what he would. That's what he was good at. That's what Ali was good at. But what they did, they made him in the movie like he was a killer. He was rude. He didn't. He, he didn't disrespected women. He disrespected Braddock. Heck, if you read Braddock's book, uh, that he liked my dad. My dad was a good guy. He liked him. It was, it, was all, it was a bunch of BS. And if you read the real clippings from the newspapers at that time, so why, the reason why I was upset is because there is no recourse for anybody saying anything about a dead person. They have no rights. Uh, there's a very liberal attorney. Uh, I, think he, I think he teaches at George Washington University. I'm trying to remember his name right now, which is very difficult for me to do because I can't even remember th- what the name of my shoes are, and I'm looking at the name right as I sit here. <laughs> um, so it, I have a little, I'm a little slow. I think as I get older, when I'm about 130, I will be Jethro. For real. <laughs> uh, I'll, have, I'll have an IQ of room now, temperature. Now, I, you know, in- so the thing, the thing is, is that, is that my dad was a really good guy. And there were many guys at my dad's funeral that my dad beat. And that beat my dad. They were there at the funeral, either as a Paul Bear or as a as a guest. So because my dad was friendly with all of these people. Hell, I got so many pictures of my dad and Joe Lewis around here. And I, how can you be friends with a guy that beat you? Sure. He just was. He was. He didn't care. As a matter of fact, when Lou DeNova beat him, in one of his last fights, I think it might have been the last one, which is in '41. He was stopped in the eighth or tenth round because of cut, and. Uh, when he got done, he got the shower, got out, and uh, somebody was having a party. I can't remember who it was. And he goes into Lou Nova's dressing room and says, hurry up, Lou. Lou is in the shower. Because he had to do interviews, you know, longer than my dad because my dad says, you know, it gets cold in the dressing room when you lose because nobody's in there talking to you. But the winner gets all the, the, the radio guys are in there talking to him. So Lou was still in the shower. My dad threw him a towel and says, come on, we got a party to go to. And, and Lou had just put a bunch of stitches in my dad's mouth and stopped him yeah. in the fight. And my, my Lou Nova couldn't figure it out. He says, this guy's Meshuggah. He says, he just fought and beat the hell out of me. Ten rounds, and now he wants me to go to a party. <laughs> hey, and also, uh, one time, I, I, I don't remember the fighter's name, but your father actually killed someone. Oh, Frankie and, Campbell. Yeah. And, yeah. And he, he actually had, he supposedly, yeah. and I don't know this to be yeah. true, the, the, the killing of Frankie Campbell was true. They were the two best California heavyweights at the time. And my dad and he fought. And he did hit him so hard in the corner on him. I don't know how many punches or whatever it was, but he, uh, it actually loosened his brain from the muscles that hold it in suspension. And um, uh, he died the following day, and my dad was totally distraught over that. He had because he was not a mean person; he was doing it for money. My dad, my dad slopped hogs. I don't know if you know what slopping hogs is, but it was a way of recycling back before you know the Food and Drug Administration says you have to have so much grain for the cattle or the hogs or whatever. And my dad would get up at like 2 o'clock in the morning and drive from Livermore, California to Lodi and Galt and Tracy and all those little towns in central California there and pick up the garbage from the grocery stores and the and the restaurants. And then he would bring it back in the truck to the ranch because my, my grandfather was a hog farmer. And they would throw it out for the hogs. The hogs would root through all the food and eat what they wanted and whatever they didn't want, they didn't eat, they would plow my dad and his brother would take and plow 
the field and use it for mulch. And my dad was getting 25 cents a day. And then he would go back, go to school at 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock in the morning. So he was working five or six hours before he ever went to school. And then afterwards he would work again, and uh, but then he would work the pins. Well, he got 25 cents a day. His first fight, he got $35. They paid him in $1 bills, and he thought it took him 45 minutes to give him the $35. Because they just stood there and went, you know, Bob, there's one. Okay. <laughs> There's two, you know, they, the, well, he had, if you figure 25 cents a day, he had about five months of work in two minutes or five, no, he had, it was the second round. So he knocked out chief caribou in the second round, which was, which was like four and a half minutes, three round, three minutes, the first round and two minutes or so in the second round. Now, in so the, you know. that was it. So that was, so that was it. And then, and then, and, uh, uh, so that's what he fought for. He fought for, for, for the money. He didn't fight for anything else. He didn't give a damn. He'd rather been an actor. He says boxing is a very religious sport. It's far better to give than receive. You know. And and in the movie, they kind of make it look like he's showing off. Yeah, that he's not that contrite he about the kill the 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 the, uh, the the boxer who died. Yeah. Yeah. They, they play this that into why played I up his villainy. Ronnie, I got upset with Ronnie because Ronnie knows the business. His father. Uh, his father was in the is in the business. His, both his brothers are in the business. Um, uh, Rance Howard is a character actor and has been for years. He was in the Cinderella Man too. He was one of the uh, sports writers. But anyway, he always puts his family in the movies, which I think is very good. I think nepotism is excellent. I think you should put your family to work if you can. Who 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 who, who is the most important to you? Your family. So if you're work, get a job and you're working, I'm going to pick you. It's real simple. It's not real hard. If you want to call it nepotism or whatever you want to call it, I just call it good common sense. Well, yeah, Clint Howard shows up in all those Ronnie Howard movies. Sure, he's yeah. always in them. He was right. in, uh, he was in Cocoon, and Apollo everything 13. he's in, he has parts somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. On on the podcast, we interviewed Craig Bierico, who Craig played Bierico. your father. He played my dad. Yeah. Have and you, have you he, had any, go ahead. No, he, did he, a fine, he actually did a fine job doing what they told him to do. In other words, in other words he, he did what Ronnie told him to act and do. But in the boxing sequences, as far as some of the, my dad's mannerisms, like wiping his, his uh, gloves off on his trunks from on the behind, you know, he wiped them from the rear. He, in doing so, he, he, did a, he did an excellent job for what Ronnie told him to do. But my dad was not like that at all. Well, not at all. What he said was that, in the movie, it's made to look like your father was, like, showing off, like, hey, maybe you don't want to fight me because I killed somebody. And that's how powerful. But your father actually was, like, like devastated. Well, he had nightmares life. his whole life, and he started smoking right after that. He did a, he did a benefit. He fought a benefit uh, for Frankie Campbell's widow and her son. And uh, and he lost, I think, three of the next four fights that he had because he just didn't have that killer instinct. He uh, he didn't really he, he he would like he would like see Frankie Campbell. You know, in other words, he would have he would have flashbacks about that and he just couldn't do it. So that's when he started really clowning around. He'd get somebody hurt and he'd, and he'd hit him real hard or something. He'd hurt, stagger him or something like that. And then he'd prance around the ring and talk to the people at ringside and wave at the women and all that shit instead of doing his business. So he, so, so actually, Al Jolson, who, who introduced Ansel Hoffman, my dad's manager, to my dad, was when he says, you've got to go see this kid fight in New York. He says, he's, and, and Ansel Hoffman said, he's crazy. This kid doesn't fight. He goes and just clowns around. He says, yeah, but you should see him. When he turns it on, it's like black and white. It's like he's clowning around and laughing and giggling and talking to the girls and combing his hair in the corner. I mean, he's not combing his hair, but, you know, brushing his hair back in the corner and everything, not paying any attention. Then he walks out in the middle of the ring and, oh, shit. He starts throwing punches from every angle, you know, just trying to kill the guy, you know. Uh, not really kill him, but knock him out, stop but him. That I mean, was, he's just that he's was like, a, like a schizo. You know? Kind of a, a problem that he was holding himself back after. Oh, yeah. He, he definitely was. He was 
because he, he really was not a harmful human being. He never had really had a fight out of the ring. And your, your dad did a lot of, you were talking before, Max, about how you said your dad would rather be a movie star. I mean, he did a lot of work. He did a lot of television. He oh, did yeah, a, he, did, he, did, he did quite a bit. He could have been, he could have been big after The Price Fighter and The Lady. Anybody that saw that, and that was his first picture that he ever did, and you could see the talent was there. Mm-hmm. And he was had funny, to be, too. He had, yes, he had, to be, he had to be told what to do. But he was on stage. He could dance. He could move. He could, he, he could sing a little bit. He, he, did, he could do everything. I mean, he, was, he was a very talented person. But like he said, he, used to, he made the money to buy fur coats for women, and it wasn't to keep them warm. It was to keep them quiet. We got a, we got a note here uh, that we just want to read to you, Max. This is actually from our pal Craig Bierko. He says, please tell Max that I've always wanted him to know that his kind words about my performance are something that I hold in my heart, and I know that his father was not accurately portrayed in the film. And uh, I have father issues myself, but if my father was reduced to a villain, I would have a problem, and I would also speak uh, on his behalf. And well, he, then, he says he'd like the honor of telling you that himself, but for now, why, it's, was he listening or something? No, he's a friend, and we told him we were going to have you on the show today, and he wanted, oh. to, he wanted to get that message to you. You can tell him I liked him in that, and I liked him in another movie that he did with, uh, oh, he played a bad guy in a couple of movies. But And then I thought he was on uh, a cop show out of New York. Uh, he's a big guy. I think he's about 6'4 or 5'. Oh, isn't yeah. He? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a big he's fella. About six, he, he's taller he, than my dad. Six, four, my dad was like 6'2. Yeah, 6'4, I think. Greg, I think, was about 6'4 or 5'. He's about my height. I'm about six four, four and a half. Well, we had him but on I, the show, and he was, you know, he was talking about us about how he he felt bad afterward. He felt bad that that, uh, uh, you know, that that you felt well, that his he, father wasn't heard, accurately portrayed. Well, he he probably heard my interviews, and 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 what the real reason was was that the only the kids of today who did not know who my father was would the the only thing that they would have to refer to would be this movie. And therefore, they would think that he was an asshole, and that's what bothered me. But but as far as the actor playing the part, absolutely. When I did the interviews, I even said, I said, hey, I said, uh, Craig Bierko, uh, Bierko. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I think that's yeah, right. it's Bierko. But, and and I said that uh, I said he did an excellent job in the picture. I said he did a terrific job. Did a good job boxing. He did a good job with the my dad's antics in the ring and everything. So he must have seen my, some of my father's fights and what he did. I'm sure of that, or they, or they, or he was told that. Mm-hmm. But whatever, he did an excellent job. We're right. glad we got you. We got to set the record straight about your dad, and that's well, that's. Uh, we're glad we got to talk to you about that. Let me ask you one thing: how does a, how does the son of a prize fighter who majored in business uh, find his way into acting? Well, I really wasn't. I, I, I didn't want to go to, to college. I wanted to go to acting school, but my mother wanted me to go to college. Nobody on either side of our family had ever graduated from college. And business school seemed to be the place for me, but hell, I'm no businessman. That's why I have a partner that writes all the checks and does everything. We've been partners for 45 or almost 50 years, I guess, now. Anyway, um, uh, and we're, we're still, can you believe we're still partners? We don't talk that much. We, you know, we, we don't see each other that much, but we've been partners all this time. We only play golf together when I'm in LA and we talk on the phone and go through lawsuits and bullshit that we're going through. <laughs> it's just like Gilbert and me. You have law, you, no, no, no. The two of us don't have lawsuits against each other. We have it with our company. Oh, okay. oh that's whatever. Different. We don't sue. We're not suing each other, you know, but any, but anyway, uh, uh, I have, uh, uh, a business degree, but it's a compulsory minor that you take a religious uh, uh, minor. In. Okay. So I took philosophy and logic and metaphysics and criminal psychology, adolescence, you know, all this kind of logic stuff, philosophy, which with a dollar you can get yourself a cup of coffee. I really didn't want to be there, but I didn't have, I didn't have the grades to graduate. I had a C average, but I didn't have the grades to graduate because I didn't have a C average in my major. So I had to go and have, have a friend of mine that was from Sacramento come down. He drove truck, and he would go through San Jose near Santa Clara, and he, would, he went, and he actually stole the blue books for me from two of the teachers. And I had the blue books. Blue books are things that, the, the, that some of the teachers used to give out, and they would have, like, six questions in them. You, you take four. Select your four and 25, 25% of each of the questions, and that's the answer. And you do it. Well, I had all, all the answers. I had the questions and the answers. 
And I couldn't copy them exactly because they knew what I would be doing. And I got, and I couldn't even get an A doing that. <laughs> even cheating. <laughs> even cheating. Hilarious. Oh, also, I, in my first year of college, I sat next to Jerry Brown, the governor of uh, California. Oh, wow. And he turned me in for looking off his page. I said, <laughs> I gave him, Jerry. Hilarious. Hey, I said, Jerry, we're not on the curve. <laughs> Not cutting anybody out. The only person I'm harming is myself. Leave me alone. <laughs> what, now hey, you, look, if you fail, I fail. If you get a good grade, <laughs> I get a good grade. That's just the way it is. <laughs> Did you jump on a motorcycle and drive to L.A. and crash the Warner Brothers lot? Is that a true story? Of how you got? No, into- I didn't crash the Warner Brothers lot. I actually was over there as a guest of somebody, and they thought I looked like Jimmy Garner. Oh. And uh, Jimmy had just left Maverick. So somebody from ABC, because all the shows, I did all the shows, 77 Sunset Surf Trip, Hawaiian Eye, Surfside 6, Bronco, right. Maverick, Cheyenne, Sugarfoot, Sugarfoot yep. Roaring Twenties, uh, uh, every, I did all of them. I, sometimes I'd play two a day. I'd be, a, I'd be like an, almost an extra, but they'd say a couple of lines in one scene on Surfside 6, and then I'd be a cowboy as part of a group of bad guys in uh, a Cheyenne or something. Surfside you know, 6 with, the, were, with the Green were, Hornet. Well, yeah, they Van two, Williams. Yeah, Van Williams. Yeah, yeah, I remember. He it. was the Green Hornet, but sure. he was under contract to Warner Brothers, and he was in uh, Surfside Six with Lee Patterson and uh, I'm trying to remember the other who's, who's English. I, they were on a houseboat in uh, down in. Uh, yeah, I remember Miami. Yeah, you did all yeah, those shows. In a houseboat, in my, it was, all the exteriors were shot in Miami, and the the boat and everything and all that stuff. Uh, the interiors and some of the. Some of the smaller stuff was so shot on the soundstage in Hollywood. How did you get Beverly Hillbillies? Oh, after I got off of CB, after I got out of Warner Brothers, I did a thing called Follow the Sun with Gary Lockwood and Barry Coe and Gigi Peru over 20th Century Fox. Did a couple Love American styles and things like that. And then I, was, I walked into Schwab's Drugstore, which is like the stage delicatessen of L.A., you know, you know, Gil, stay everybody, yeah. all the actors oh, hang oh, out. Who they is, used to. Well, Lana, was, Turner, Lana, Lana Turner, Turner, supposedly. Was allegedly well, sorry, discovered. Lana Turner was supposedly discovered at Schwab's. Yeah, but Schwab's it was a different Schwab's. It wasn't the one on Laurel okay. Canyon. Oh, and I so, see. Okay, so, yeah, and they so I was, asked I was, you to I audition. I happened to walk in, and Rod Steiger was sitting there with a guy named Clegg Hoyt, who was a character actor, and they were, they, they were roommates in New York. And um, uh, Ro- I was sitting down there having coffee, like, you know, talking shop. And Ross Martin came in. Ross Martin, who had who, who Wild actually, Wild West. Yeah, Artemis Gordon. Oh, yeah. Uh, but no, but he played, but before that, he played uh, John Vivian's sidekick in Mr. Lucky. Oh, yes. Which was the, uh, which was the, uh, um, oh, God, who's the director that married Julie uh, Andrews? Blake, Blake Edwards? Blake Edwards. Blake yeah. Edwards is Mr. Lucky. It was, right. it was about a gambling ship off oh, the coast I, of California. Ask, yeah. You remember Mr. Lucky? Oh, yes. 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 And, and it was, it was, it was uh, John Vivian and Ross Martin. And Ross came in and said, hey, they're casting for this little Abner character or whatever, something like that, uh, country boy, in uh, a general service studio, and it's an open call. So I got on my motorcycle, which I had a Triumph 500 at the time, and went over to the studio. And um, they said, when I went in there, they said, uh, can you do a southern accent? And I said, yes. And they said, what's wrong with you? And I said, well, I've got laryngitis. (laughs) <laughs> so I, I can come back on Monday. And what happened is I didn't have laryngitis. I didn't have a southern accent, so I went and got an Andy Griffith album, This Is Football, so they call oh, it football. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, yes. And the Jonathan Winley- Willi- Willi- Winters album, like what he do with Marty Frickert and all these different characters he would do. And I have a good ear, but so I just kind of put a bunch of that stuff together, and I went in there, and, and I did and I did the, the thing, and they called me back for, I did a reading, and they called me back for a screen test. And in the screen test, they didn't want me. They wanted another guy named Roger Torrey, who was about 6'6 six, six and about 240 pounds and blonde curly hair. And they kept testing him. And they didn't work, you know, well, I was just sitting there waiting to be tested. You know, they tested him two or three times, then they test a guy, or no, they test him once, then they test another guy, the other guy would go, and then they test him again, and they test another guy and let the other guy go. They had about five of us there. And Irene Ryan was there, she was testing too. And so we started talking while we were sitting there wasting time. So I went to lunch with her, and she took me to this little place called The Shack. 
and uh, I had, uh, I think I had three double beef eater martinis, and I'm not a drinker. <laughs> I mean, that's like drink. That's like pouring gasoline on a fire because I don't drink. I, so I, you I'm, and I'm, you and Granny are having <laughs> martinis together. Oh yeah, we, you we you know, Irene, you, Granny used to say, "Martinis and I can have two at the most, three or four, and I'm under the table, and five or six, and I'm under the host." <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, it was so you, funny. She you was have a, a character. Yeah, I'll bet she was. We're and anyway, fans. so I was bombed. I come back, and they right after lunch, they want me to do my scene. So it's a scene where Buddy Epson walks into the cabin, and I walk into the cabin. Well, they said, well, we, you know, can you do it, Max, in one take? Because we've got, we're, we're out of time, and we got this, and, you know, because they've been doing this other kid five times, you know. And so just keep going, just keep going. You know, if you, if you screw up the line or something, just keep going. So what I did is I walk, walked into the cabin, and I was so bombed, I hit the, the door jam with my shoulder accidentally, not intentionally. And I, and I looked at the door jam, and I just put a big grin on my face and said, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and when Paul Henning said that he saw that, he said, that's Jethro. He says, any guy that will talk to a door jam, that's the guy. Well, it, it's, you know, a, so. it's a pretty impressive performance. I mean, you know, as a kid watching the show, I mean, I always assumed that you were that you were a good old boy when, in fact, you're a guy from Oakland. Well, I was born in Oakland, but raised in Sacramento, California. Well, Sacramento, but Northern California. Right. I, I mean, I always Absolutely. thought, always I had thought no you were. Accent. Yeah. I, I had none of that. And the other thing is, uh, what I did was I I try I didn't learn the the, the words really well. So I had to take more time. I had to think about the words. So it came out a little differently than if I just spelled them out, you know? Now, if I, I knew them, like, so well that I would just do it, I'd have to think about what the hell I was doing. Hell, I did some things on the show there. Where I, Miss Hathaway was going to take me bird watching one day, and she, was, she said, M -m 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 Mr. Clampett, I'm taking Master Jethro out to to uh, uh, do some, I don't know, aviary work or whatever. <laughs> he said, I'm going to take him out, and uh, we're going to go looking for red-headed nuthatches and yellow-breasted sapsuckers. Well, it didn't come out that way. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it came out as uh, 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 yellow-breasted yellow -breasted, uh, nut scratchers or something like that. <laughs> And uh, red, I mean nut hatches, or nut nut hatch, I don't know. And then yellow breasted uh, PSers, you know. Uh, that's the way it came out. I mean, I just said it, and they everybody would laugh, and they and and, and then Buddy Epson yelled, "Print!" <laughs> I, I, See, we we play a lot of these flubs, all these screw ups. We play all these fuck ups at the end at a Christmas party. You oh, know, like, a, oh, like a looper was, reel, yeah. Now, I a heard reel for all of us, you know. That... And one time, one time, I, uh, uh, Buddy was in Buddy, Uncle Jed was in bed, and he was supposed to be sick, but he had his clothes on. I knew he had his clothes on. So uh, Granny and, and, and Ellie Mae came up, and the, the, the idea was for, for Granny to pull down his, for, 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 oh, I'm sorry, for me to pull down his covers and say, see, he ain't sick, Granny. And if I pull it down, he's got this god dang thing sticking out of his crotch about a foot long, two <laughs> feet long. <laughs> everybody laughed except Donna. Donna says, that's nasty. <laughs> you know, but everybody else was laughing. They, they, it was Buddy and Irene's gag. Now, I heard you know. Donna Douglas. Well, Donna was, was a sweetheart. She just passed away yeah, in January. Yeah, rest in peace. She just passed and, away. And she was and like... the only... I am the last of the Mohicans. You are, buddy. And, and uh, she... No, I mean, of the cast, of the most of the guest stars, of all the people who were on there, and of the producer, the writer, the director, uh, the the editor, um... Everybody's gone. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, I, now, I'm it. Donna Douglas back then was like a TV sex symbol. Oh, yeah. Well, I, Jesus. I mean, yeah. she was a very, very beautiful girl. I mean, I took her out. I had found out who she was before. And we didn't have any idea on the series. This was in 1961 before we even went out for the series. And I had seen her picture, and I called her up blind, and I got a date with her. She took me to the Blessed Sacrament Church in uh in, in Hollywood, and I said that was our only date. <laughs> that's I said, that's time. enough. That's enough now, for me. I heard she did a movie with Elvis Presley and actually had an affair 
with Elvis? Well, I can't answer that honestly, but I can answer it dishonestly. And what I <laughs> we'll take know it, is that something happened between the two of them. And they must have, Elvis must have conned her or something like that because she was very easy to, to con because she was so legitimate. She was very straight. And um, she had almost an emotional breakdown because of Elvis, and she wouldn't talk about Elvis. You couldn't ask her about Elvis wow. for the whole time, ever since that movie in 67 or something, all the way up till we were at an autograph signing in the beginning of 2013 in L.A., and the rule of thumb was you don't ask her about Elvis because she won't answer. Wow. So whatever happened, I don't know. But it was pretty drastic, and she was very upset for a long time. She wanted to leave the show and everything. I mean, leave the hillbillies and everything. And the Paul, the Hennings took, them, took her over to their house, and she stayed there. I don't know what she was afraid of or what the hell happened. I have no idea, because Elvis was really a, a good guy. One time we were at a fair, and I think it was in Memphis, where he lived, and uh, we were doing the Mid-South Fair or something like that, and we were on stage going doing some kind of an act, our little, you know, you know, song and dance act where I basically played straight man for granny and Donna sang a little bit and we did a little, you know, soft shoe type crap like Bob Hope does, you know, that any moron can do. He gave <laughs> it to me. I had to do that. Hey. You know, how do you, how, how, how do you step on your third foot? You know, it was very difficult to do. I proceeded to do it, you know, and so anyway, uh, backstage and over the over the mic, the the big speaker over the over the uh, place where we were came. Come listen to a story about a t- about a man named Jed pulled my near barely kept his family with you. It was Elvis. He was on, doing a mic. It was because that's where he lived in in Memphis, and he came it was using the mic from backstage. And it was funny. I think that's when Donna first met him. Wow. That was in like '64, but they never got together or anything, and never dated until she did the movie, and then who knows what happened there. But one thing I can say about Donna: I never heard her swear in all the time I knew her. Never heard she'd say "golly, gosh, darn." She, I never heard her use any four-letter words other than "love" and you know things like that. But nothing, no, 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 no foul language at all. And she would always say "Maxi, Maxi, <laughs> yeah, you're." Uh, Maxie, you're being a bad boy. Yep. You used to hang out with the Rat Pack, Frank and Dino and Sammy. Well, the, I, the way I got into that was I got into it through with Lindsey Crosby. Lindsey was so drunk most of the time, he stayed at my house, he couldn't drive home. <laughs> Who is I, this? Remember when, I remember when John Glenn went up into space and, and Lindsey was at my place and he was drinking Aqua Velva. I mean, that's how bad it was. He was drinking out of Aqua Velva, and his brother Philip came over and got him. Now, who is Lindsey? Lindsey Crosby. Yep, Lindsey was Lindsey, and well, you see, Lindsey and Gary and Philip and oh, Dennis. Oh, 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 Bing's kid. Oh, did their, okay. Did right. Their act together. Right, right, right. You know, yes. They all did their their act. That was Dick, that was Bing and Dixie's kids. They had four four kids. He only had the one daughter, Mary. Now yeah, that, did, was his, that was his second marriage with uh, Catherine Grant. Now, did Bing Crosby used to beat them? That's what I always heard. I don't know. He, I, we never talked much about Bong. That's what he used to call him, Bong. So Bing is Bing Bong. So he used to call him Old Bong. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. That's what Lindsay called him. And Lindsay, they, Lindsay yeah, Gary used to call Lindsay Moon Man, and Lindsay hated it. Because his head was bigger than his body. He had this real, really big head for a little guy. He was short, <laughs> husky. But he had this big head, and they called him Moon Man. And Gary used to pick on him all the time and belittle him. And that's where Lindsay got his insecurity from. But uh, they all drank. And uh, Gary's the only one that, well, Gary's the one that I knew that came out of it. He went AA, and then he, he got married, and he stayed pretty straight until he had his heart attack and passed away, I think. But anyway, Lindsay and I were in Vegas, and we hung out in the Sam's uh, uh, steam room with Dean and Frank and Sammy. They used to have robes in the steam room, and it used to say, uh, Don Rickles had the rhino on the back of his. I think Buddy Hackett had fats. Um, <laughs> uh, Dean had the dago. Uh, uh, Frank had the pope. Uh, Sammy had the Jew. Um, what else? <laughs> Written on the, they had these things printed on their bathrobes? 
Wow. Those were all on the white bathrobes wow. in the steam room at the Sands Hotel. I love it. And they were all they all they all stayed there. But I mean, they you know they when they were there performing when they did Sergeant's when they did Ocean's Eleven and Sergeant's Three up in the desert and everything, they'd come down and do the show. They'd commute in the jet. So you know when they were up in Kanab, Utah, doing this western, they'd fly back down to Vegas and do the show and go back after after or in the morning or whenever they would be there. Who knows what they were doing? I have no idea. I know one thing: Dean did not stay up late because he was all, we, when he was there and didn't have to shoot or anything. He was just there, part of the group. Uh, he would get up. He would leave earlier after they would get done, and he'd go to his room, go to sleep, get up, and play golf at six or seven in the morning. He loved golf, so he was always playing golf. He'd go and socialize a little bit. He'd go gamble a little bit, but he'd get some sleep. He didn't stay up till two, three, four in the morning. That wasn't his thing. I I heard he was the only person to say no to Frank Sinatra. Who, Dino? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if he was the only person, but he definitely did not take orders. I mean, and because Frank loved him. I mean, he really loved him. And 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 and, and Dean loved Frank. But you know, it's like Frank would say no to people and no to Dean and Dean would say no to Frank. Most all of the other people that I know of, everything was yes. Although I was drunk the night that I was there, and I was in the lounge. See, after they get off the stage, they walk out the door from the stage, and they come out, will go outside by the pool, then walk back inside, kind of half jog, come <laughs> back inside, and they go into the lounge. And the lounge is all taped off with, like, uh, police, you know, that yellow tape. And they would have tables set up there with the chairs, and they'd have uh, the Smirnoff vodka, and, they, and, and and they'd have soda, and they'd have Jack Daniels, and they'd have uh, let's see, the Scotch was Scotch was I can't remember the Scotch J and B I think, and they'd have that at every one of the tables. Those three vodka, Scotch, and Jack Daniels at every table. And they'd line up like three or four tables, and people would sit on both sides. That was generally the crew. You know, the, you know Frank and Dean and Sammy, Stella Stevens, who would be there, oh, whoever yeah. was there at the time. And uh, the time that I was there, that I remember with Frank, I sat at the end of the table next to uh, Ed Pucci, who was the bodyguard. Frank got him as a bodyguard for little Frank when he got kidnapped. And anyway, we were there sitting there, and... Everybody was laughing and talking to Frank, and everybody was telling jokes. And I was standing there. I was sitting there, and I turned around or something, stood up, and turned around, was talking to somebody else, or talking to Lindsay, and I felt these ice cubes go down my back. And I jumped, and I said, God damn it, you know, swearing and everything else. And everybody's laughing. And I look around, and Frank's got the wet hands. He's drying them off. So I knew that he put them down my back. So on every table was an ice bucket with the ice in it. So I just took the whole ice bucket and dumped it over his head. <laughs> wow, you brave man. <laughs> his piece kind of slid, you know. I, mean, was, I love it. I will tell you this much. Nobody laughed until Frank laughed. Ah, uh, of course. I, it was like he could pull the shit on somebody else, but... An outsider like me that wasn't really part of the group, you know, I was like a fringe guy, would not do that. But then when he laughed, and then pretty soon, pretty soon, different people started to leave the table. And the next thing you know, Lindsay and I were the only two there. We were dead drunk. And we were, there were like 20 places for people to sit. Nobody comes through that line until everybody leaves. That was a rule. So Lindsay and I said, screw it. We're just going to sit here. And then we looked around until we found some good-looking girls. And was, hey, come on, sit down over here. There was plenty of liquor to drink. It was all free. So we just did that. We weren't invited to a lot of places, though, you know? <laughs> now, Lindsay and I, were not, we, were, we, weren't, we weren't highly popular. Do you know anything as far as about the kidnapping, the Frank Jr. kidnapping? From up here at Tahoe, no. I didn't know anything about that at all. I, as a matter of fact, the only information I ever got about that is when Frank, uh, Frank Jr. and I did uh, Hollywood Squares, and he was telling me a little bit about it. You know, He says, it was pretty scary. And the, I said, I would imagine it was pretty scary. You don't know whether these guys are, 
you know, wackos. They know your your dad's going to pay, but they, they don't know if they're going to get. They may take you and you know feed you to the fish. You know. Yeah, that was you know, it, very scary. They, they well, they fish for Italian fish. You know, so <laughs> it was okay. Max, we have to ask you about about your films, about your independent films in the seventies. And Gilbert and I were talking about Ode to Billy Joe, which is a fascinating story in itself, and it's based on the famous Bobby Gentry song. And and how did that fall together? I mean, you bought the the film rights to the song. Well, what what happened is Roger, my partner, knew Bobby Gentry when she was singing in Westwood as a as a UCLA uh, undergrad, and she would just. You know, singing, you know, like the kids that would sit in the, in, the, uh, in the street corners and sing, and you give them money. And so he knew her from that, and he liked her as a person. And she was going to school at the time, and I guess she was making some money singing, and she was singing, having a good time. And Roger knew her, met her, and either took her out or, or socially just knew her. And so when we did uh, Macon County Line, she did the theme song for it. We oh, asked that's her, right. And she, and she did the theme song another time, another place. And uh, she sang it. And then when she saw the movie, she asked us, wouldn't we, would we think about doing Ode to Billy Joe? She came up with it, not us. And she asked us that. And I, Roger said, well, Max, you can write it, can't you? And I said, no. You know, Main County Line was different. I could write that. Ode to Billy Joe was a love story. And I was not sure how to write, go about writing that. So one night I said, no. So, but we did the McCulloughs, a little picture called the McCulloughs. It uh, made a little bit of money. Yeah, with Forrest Tucker. It was my, but it, yeah, with, with Forrest Tucker. But it was my first, the first time that I ever directed. So, and I used that, uh, that directing, to get the deal with Warner Brothers on, uh, on Ode to Billy Joe. But what happened was, is that, is that, uh, uh, I couldn't write it. I tried to sit down and write it once, and I tried again, and I just couldn't do it. So I'm watching television one night, and I see Summer of 42. And I said, it was written by Herman Rauscher. And I said, well, if we can get that guy to write this thing, then let's do it. So we, I, I sent Herman Rauscher. A, I called him, got his number, called him. He said no. I said, well, at least listen. I said, do you know the song? He said, no, not really. So I got him and sent him the album with the song on it and so forth. And he, he got back to me and he said, if I can write it the way I want to write it, why the boy jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge, then I'll do it. And so he said, I said, yeah, okay, give it a shot. So we paid him, uh, gave him a substantial sum of money. I can't remember what it was, but today it would be probably a couple million bucks, equivalent to that. Of course, that was in 19... 19- 74 because uh, because in the song max there's no there's no explanation for why billy joe jumps off the tallahatchie bridge so you had to you oh had that's to, right you oh, had to come so up with herman him. had to come out here and meet with bobby and talk to bobby and get all the information and then along with the song he went back to uh to uh connecticut where he lived and he wrote he wrote the script and that was it. We shot the script. That's it. We didn't have a bunch of rewrites or anything else. We just shot what we, he wrote. So it was pretty simple. When we got the right writer that right. could write something that Bobby Gentry liked, and uh, was, it, cause she filled in the gaps, and that's the way it went. Now, now can we ask you a few you things? You can ask me anything, Gil. Okay. I don't <laughs> it's a terrific little film, by the way. Oh, to Bobby uh, Joe. You worked Ode with to Billy Ode to Billy Joe. Ode to Billy, Ode to Billy Joe. Excuse me. You worked <laughs> with both Milton Pearl and Forrest Tucker. Uh oh. <laughs> Let both? me tell you. Yeah. I, I I didn't work with Milton Pearl. I just heckled him from the audience. But I knew Milton pretty well from Hillcrest Crest Country Club and different shows and so forth. And he and my dad were good friends. Now I heard Milton Pearl and Forrest Tucker had something. Yes, it's in- true. <laughs> Wait you you saw it? No, well, let me put it to you this way. <laughs> <laughs> Forrest Tucker thought he had water on the knee one time, and he went to the doctor, and the doctor just told him his aim was bad. <laughs> 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 there were 
if there were three guys. There was Milton Berle, Forrest Tucker, and uh, Vic, Victor Mature. Oh, Victor Mature, a new name. A Hold new on. name to put on the list. Two, two more. Uh, and another one was Bob Fallon. He was married to Marie Wilson, my friend Irma. Okay. Bob Fallon, that's a new one. He, Bob yeah. Fallon was a producer, and he was oh, married okay. to Marie Wilson. And uh, uh, he was also known as uh, uh, Racing at Santa Anita. <laughs> And who was there? Was another one? No, well, that's what I said. Bob he gave Fallon, them to you. Oh, oh, Victor yeah. Ma- Milton Berle, Mature, Forrest Milton Tucker, Berle Victor and Mature. Forrest Tucker. We, we heard now, that's a hell of a foursome if you're going to play golf. Yeah. We don't need any clubs. We were, we were told <laughs> that right. the comedian guy Marks was on that hey, list. Hey, too. wait a minute. You're not supposed to be funny. I'm the one who's supposed to be funny. You're interviewing me. Don't be funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Frank, Frank was just saying because we interviewed someone. Who told us that the comedian, Guy Marks. You remember Guy Marks? Oh, yeah. yeah. Tremendous penis on him, too. Yeah, Bobby Rydell told us that. But, the, but the, <laughs> one thing, the one thing about Guy Marks is when they circumcised him, they cut off the foreskin around his head. <laughs> <laughs> Max, let's talk a little bit for a couple of seconds about the Wild McCullers, which has this wonderful cast. I I just want to talk about <laughs> celebrity <laughs> penises. <laughs> hey, I don't care hey. about your movie career. Hey, wait a minute. What about what about Dara? Maybe she wants to talk about him. You shouldn't want to. I don't know. You guys, she's not a guy, I don't think. So. <laughs> we keep her in the dark about stuff yes. like that. Yeah, in the dark, right. But the, the, the Wild McCulloughs had this great cast. Forrest Tucker, William Demarest. Oh, yeah, Bill oh, Demarest was yeah. great. I love Bill. Did William Demarest have a large penis? <laughs> <laughs> All I know is he stirred his drink with his thumb. <laughs> That's all. I- Hey, look! It you can tell the guy is you can tell the guy is well endowed when he uses it for a swizzle stick. You know, that's it. <laughs> oh Lord! But this cast: Mike Mazurki, uh, Vito Scotti, who Gilbert and I love, and of course yeah. Doodles now, Vito, Weaver. Vito was great. Yeah, he's a legend. And Doodles Weaver. Uh, Doodles, uh, Doodles yeah. was great too. He was always he was funny. And another guy, uh, Billy uh, Billy Curtis. Oh, Billy midget. Curtis, yeah. But yeah. Doodles Weaver was the uncle of Sigourney Weaver. Correct. From Sir, Sigourney Weaver, yes. Yeah. yeah. What's the name? Was it? Was it Andy? Was it? What's the name that was on the Hollywood Squares? That was her father. Oh no, no! I think oh, that uh, Pat Weaver. Charlie Weaver. Pat Weaver. Pat, no, Pat. Charlie Weaver. That was a pseudonym. No, his that daughter. That was a stage name. His daughter was the Arquette. Right, because his name was Cliff Arquette. Yeah, Rosanna Arquette and David Arquette. That's are, what it was. Okay. Yeah. Right. Are you sure now? Charlie Weaver yes. was Charlie, Charlie Weaver's Weaver. Name was Arquette. Yeah, yeah Arquette, Cliff Arquette. And I know this because uh, Cliff Arquette was a Jew. Charlie Weaver was a stage name. I got you. Right. I didn't know that. But Pat Weaver, who was the head of NBC or something like that. Uh, yes. Oral, Oral K. Pat Weaver. Correct. He was Doodles Weaver's brother. And and he and he was the father of Sigourney Weaver. Now you got it. And he played okay. first base. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what? He's doing a little who's on first. Yeah. Well, t- tell oh, us. And she, did, and she had a penis. <laughs> so that's, you know. We could do 45 minutes on, on famous penises in the state of California. <laughs> yeah. Now, I heard Liam Neeson. He's the more you of heard? a younger guy. Is that but... what you heard? I know, no, I, I know who Liam Neeson is. <laughs> but I heard he has a big penis. Well, you have to ask the women because you have to, you have to judge by the octave of their orgasm. <laughs> Well, it depends upon where it goes. You know, if you have, ah, and then you have, ah, you know, it depends on what it is, you know. That's, that, you get it. And you find out. You don't even have to be in the room. You just tape it. You know. Uh, now, Max, tell us, before we wrap it up, tell us a little bit about Vito Scotti or Mike Mazurki or, or Doodles, any of them. Mike, Mike Mazurki, I'd known Mike, and Mike had done the Beverly Hillbillies. Yeah. Mike, Mike. Mike was a good guy. I, I knew Mike for a long time. And uh, 
uh, Vito Scotty, I would run into him at Schwab's drugstore a lot. We love Vito Scotty, and he was he was he would do just like he does, you know, in the movies, you know, yeah. just his little stutter kind of thing. He's a, the Mater D kind of guy, you yeah. know. He's yes. always he's in the Godfather. He in the, what was he was in the Godfather? Yeah. What was he in the Godfather? He was doing something in the Godfather. I don't know. Yeah, he's the had, he's. I think boy, he's the baker who makes the cake for the wedding cake. Oh, that was it. That right. was it. That right. was it. Right. That was that was it. I could I can't remember, but Vito was a. Peter was a good guy. I, I I just had a lot of guys like Macon County Line. And, I had uh, uh, oh god, he played in uh, oh shoot, I met him in <clears throat> when I did a movie that was terrible. It was called The Long Ride Home. It was a long, believe me, it was the long <laughs> ride home. We we no. did a shot it up in Kanab, Utah. It was with Glenn Ford, George Hamilton, Inger Stevens. Oh, great cast. And um, oh god, what was it? What was his name? Oh. Um, Harry Dean Stanton. Oh, we love him. Yeah. Um, let's see, Harry Dean. Now, I'm trying to think of who else was there. You worked with Phil Silvers. Well, Phil was on the Beverly Hillbillies. He played a guy named Swifty Schaefer. Honest John. Yeah. Honest John. Yeah. Swifty Schaefer, and he sold us the 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 uh, New York the, the bridge. <laughs> the White the, House. Didn't he say the no, White he House? He sold us the White House and the bridge and the zoo and everything. He sold us everything. <laughs> I mean, you know, he was, he was, Jed was buying that day. What, you what know, he was, was buying, whatever he was buying, and just, Phil was selling. What was Phil Silvers like to work with? Well, he was, you know, I mean, he, you know, he's in the Guinness Book of Records, you know. Did you know that? No. no. Phil Silvers? No. Yeah. What for? The only living son of a bitch to interrupt himself. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> what about Don Rickles? Oh, Don is about as sweet a person as you'd ever want to meet. That is his whole character is on stage. He is nothing like that particular character. Nothing. His whole personality is different. He's a Jew married an Italian that worked at uh, CMA, I think it was. She worked as a secretary. They've been married for 50 years. I think Don's 80-something now. I used to see him at, the, at, the, uh, at Slate Brothers on Santa Monica Boulevard. Yeah, I think he's 89. I think he just turned 89. On Santa Monica. He was on Santa Monica. No, he was on La Cienega Boulevard, Slate Brothers. He used to play there. Jack Jones used to play there. Hell, Jack Jones was you and I you were in the Air Force Reserve together. We used to go down from L.A., drive together to go down to March Air Force Base for our weekends. Cool stuff. Right. Don oh, Rickles was a sweet guy then. Oh, Don was a Don was a terrific guy. Don was he just created that character that that is so funny. You know, it's almost like Buddy Hackett. Buddy Hackett had a little bit of an ass in him. I mean, he actually had a big ass, but I'm saying he was he was uh, he was more he was bright. Buddy Hackett was one of the smartest guys business-wise that I've ever met. He one time he was telling me at the golf course he says uh you know, he says that uh, uh, his attorney read his contract and he was there with whoever he was talking to at the casino that he was doing his deal with in Vegas. And they said, yeah, your attorney okayed this. And and Buddy says, but he ain't the one that's shining it. <laughs> he says, I am. <laughs> he says, so I don't give a shit what he knows. I got to know. <laughs> <laughs> and one night, one night he was on the Johnny Carson show, and Buddy sits. You know, Johnny's on the right of the screen, or he's actually to the to the to the guest's left. He sits to the left of the guest, but if you're watching it on screen, he's to the right. Okay, so Johnny is saying to Buddy, and Buddy is talking to him. Now, Buddy is now J Johnny Carson is on Buddy's left, so. Buddy's talking out of the left side of his mouth like this, you know. And, you know, what he's saying, you know, all this stuff, you know. So you know, Johnny asked him, he says, how come you talk out of the side of your mouth like that, buddy? And Buddy says, well, if you sat over here, I talk out of that side. <laughs> <laughs> what about some of the other people who were on the Beverly Hillbillies with you, um, Max, like John Carradine or, or Hans Conried? Louis Nye. Oh, well, I didn't have I didn't have much to do with him. I mean, you know, and Charlie Ruggles. Right, Charlie I mean, Ruggles. I was, 
with him. I was there with him, but I didn't really. Sammy Davis. Yeah. I didn't. I, I saw Sammy more off and on the golf course than I did on the Beverly Hillbilly set. But uh, I really didn't do many scenes with him, you know, or, or if any. You know, uh, and Gloria Carradine Swanson had, was older and had a lot of arthritis at that time. His hands were really bad at that time. I remember a, a I remember him. He was, I think it was him who was telling me the story that he he used to drink and they used to drink with um, uh, with John great, Barrymore. Uh, yeah, with Barrymore yeah. and with Flynn, with Errol Flynn and with the director Billy Wilder and all of them. They used to have a whole group that played cards and drank. And one time um, they they had an argument about who could do Shakespeare better, um, uh, Barrymore or Carradine. So Carradine is supposed to, they, they set up this scene and they say, okay, John, you just had this great meal as King Henry VIII or whatever it is, and you you come out the door and you're just relishing in the fullness of this meal that you've just had that was so wonderful. And so he does it. He goes and he does this scene, and it's terrific, you know, by himself and all that. And then they shoot the picture, the, the John Barrymore coming out of the door, zipping up his pants. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Hysterical, man. I guess you didn't get it right away. <laughs> Zipping up his fly. Yeah, yeah yes. got it. You got he, it. He just after, we, after this, after you see him, yeah, we, him relishing in this feast that he just had. Trust and me. And here comes Barrymore. All he does doesn't say a word. Just tr- walks out and zips up his fly. Trust us. That's the first thing we think of <laughs> on this show. Oh. That's, a, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Anyway, oh, I, I thought gotta... that joke laid deader than a friggin' rattlesnake. No, man. We, no, no, we understand every dick joke on this show. <laughs> oh, every dick joke. <laughs> <laughs> now, anyway, I... the other thing is that what was it? Oh, somebody said it was something about. Uh, um. Uh, oh, the other thing about me, I said I'm in the Guinness Book of Records too. I said and they said what for? And I said with me, if you take a breath, you lose your friggin' turn. <laughs> well, that's when I have to jump in. Because <laughs> we gotta well, wrap up now. Said, I said, if your if your if your husband's got if Gil's got something else to do today, all he has to do is ask me the first question and then leave. Well, yeah. <laughs> I said I can I can ask myself questions and answer them. You're our favorite I can kind do, of guest. I can yes. insult myself and everything. So I'm gonna I talk no matter what. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gilbert Gottfried. I, I show up even when I'm not this invited. This has yeah. been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. Oh. And we have been talking to Jethro on the Beverly Hillbillies, Max Bear Jr. The very entertaining, Max Bear the Jr. very entertaining and son of great price fighter, Max Bayer Sr. We've been talking to Max. Well, Max Bayer Jr. has been talking, and we tried to throw in a word hey, here Gil. or there. Gil is, this a, Gil, is this an unusual position for you to be in? Yeah. <laughs> now, now, Max, I read that you you can uh, you said you can speak a little Jethro uh, uh, when pushed. Can I you, speak a little Jethro? Can you give us a little something? To go uh, out on well, the only thing I can do, I can't do it as high as I used to, is hard dog. <laughs> That'll do it. Oh, it thank doesn't get you. up that high anymore unless somebody's squeezing something. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what do you what do you got coming up? You're still working on the casino project. Oh, I've got I have the rights for Beverly Hillbillies. I got slot machines. I've got online games, and they pay very well. Good. And I, it's very it's passive income. I don't have to do anything. And yet I'm still looking at, at doing a casino if the opportunity ever comes up. But I will not build it because of the fact that it, right, you can't build a casino. And gaming is moving so fast to online stuff that eventually, within the next 10 years probably, I, you'll be able to gamble online. And it will destroy 
a lot of the uh, smaller casinos. Vegas, it will not hurt, really, I don't believe. But it'll hurt the other places. You know, Atlantic City will probably be eventually gone, pretty much. Well, we hope we and see this a lot casino. Of the Indian casinos, that are a lot of the in casinos that are on the rivers that are in in states bordering big states, like, and for I'm example, Gilbert Indiana, has, again. Indiana has a casino, <laughs> but now they're going to... Daddy. This has been Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal He's going to keep talking, Max. And again, oh, my co-host is Frank Santo Padre. And again, uh, we've been talking to Max Bayer Jr., star of the Beverly Hillbillies. Max, That's bullshit, Gil. You've been listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Max. Thank you. <laughs> 